with a bang. So could I warn you that these things are going to be loud, so you do need to protect your ears. Worst thing you could possibly do when you're trying to protect your ears is stuff your fingers in them. Because if you stuff your fingers in your ears, you're going to end up with two problems. Firstly, you cannot hear what I am saying. And secondly, because your mouth, your throat and your ears are all connected together, you block your ears up, the pressure from these guns will build up inside your mouth and it will blow out your teeth. I'm going to suggest to protect your ears that you cover them like this. Could you all do that please so you can protect your ears? Do. And then could you all open your mouth so equalise the pressure within them? Oh, you all look wonderful, you really do. Now you will get some words of warning, and those words of warning will be, have a care. So the gunners will shout that before they fire. So we're going to start the show with a bang, firing one of our pieces here, it's a piece of artillery. They probably are, they don't like easy. Have a care! Bella, that's the name of the gun, prepare to give fire, give fire! Now, we're going to show you a selection of guns, some of the guns that we have. The, not the whole selection, not the whole collection. A couple of very early ones that we're going to show you first. Uh, one is a pole gun, in this case a brass one. Uh, the origin of this was actually found under the rubble of a castle that had been destroyed in 1399. It was Tannenberg Castle in Lower Saxony. Uh, we've also got a Cray Key. Now, Cray Key is in fact a malevolent sea monster from Norway. But in this case, it's been given to the name of the gun. It's a, a hand cannon, it's like a small cannon on the end of a pole. Round about uh, 1399, these guns were in use. Are we ready? Now, there were normally two man crew. Our colleagues here are very, very well versed at firing in one mouth. So, the first one over there is the hand cannon. And the, second... and the second one, Greggy. And the second one, Greggy. Now, the next gun we're going to show you is uh, a copy of one that would have been used at the Battle of Towton. That's Palm Sunday in 1461. We know we can prove that these were in use then because there's two beats of two separate guns that were actually found on the battlefield plus the lead pellets that were fired out of them. Uh, to load it, they're going to put some powder down, a, a fixed amount of powder down the barrel. They would put a ball down it and some wadding and then ram it down with a ramrod. There's the wadding going down. That's the ramrod. Then they're going to prime the gun. There's a small hole at the side of the gun. Small amount of powder is put on a little pan that's at the side of it. And then they're going to fire it using a piece of match cord, which is burning rope soaked in saltpeter. Now ready for firing. Have a care. And that lead ball will go around about 150 yards. The previous ones would have gone about 50 or 60 yards. Now we've got some with mechanisms on. These are firing mechanisms from around about uh, anything from about Bosworth period, which is the one that uh, kaylee has got. Talking around about 1485, and the one that Robin's got probably a little bit later, nearly as, as, probably as late as 1500. So these are going to be loaded if you like to load them up. Good. Right, so we can fire these using a bullet because they have firing mechanisms on them. They're called serpents or sears. Early form of firing mechanism. They were using a lock, which is a mechanism which is inside a metal plate. And they were called locks because the originals were made by locksmiths, as in flint locks, match locks, dog locks, wheel locks, English locks, and so on. In your own time. Okay, prepare to give fire. Give fire! It was a lady 
speed gun. Now, going back to the bigger gun that you heard earlier, this is a small field piece. It fired a ball that weighed one and a half pound that went three quarters of a mile. And there were quite a few of these around at the time. In fact, at the Battle of Bosworth, they brought 25 of these from the Tower of London to actually use in the battle. Uh, we're going to load it. The first thing we're going to do is search the inside of the gun to check that there are no burning bits from the previous firing. Put that down the barrel. It's got little curly bits on the end. It'll scrape out any burning embers. Now, everybody knew what the sound should be. If it was anything there, they turn it check it, make sure that there were no bits down there and pull them out. Now there might still be some burning embers down there, so they're now going to use a very highly technical piece of equipment called the wet mop. This is dipped in some water, which is why it's called the wet mop. It's put down the barrel and the water puts out the burning embers. A little bit of water comes up the little vent at the bottom of the barrel and puts out the burning embers that might be on there. And believe me, there will be some. Now, gunpowder doesn't work very well if it's mixed with water. So they're now going to use another very highly technical piece of equipment called the dry mop, which goes down the barrel and dries out the water. Then they put a fixed charge of powder down. Now ours is wrapped up in paper. We're not sure what the originals were wrapped up in. We've actually seen uh, sort of diagrams of these things as, as early as 1384, wrapped up in some, some sort of device. A fixed measured amount of powder. That's settled down at the base of the gun using a rammer, a ball will be put down, and then some wadding. The wadding serves two purposes. When you ram it down, it compresses the gunpowder, and if you happen to be firing downhill, it'll stop the ball from rolling out. Then the gun has to be uh, used, or fused really, for want of a better word, primed using a vent spike, which goes down the vent at the base of the barrel, pierces through the paper cartridge, and you fill that uh, small vent with some gunpowder. Nearly half the guns in the 15th century were, in fact, muzzle breech loaders. This is a muzzle loader, but half the guns were breech loaders. You actually had a device that you could fit in the base of the gun, which was already loaded with ball and powder. A lot quicker to load. The problem is they were far more dangerous. Now we're going to fire it. We put some gunpowder on to act as a fuse. It's now ready for firing. Have a care. Bella, that's the name of the gun. Prepare to give fire. Give fire. Oh. <laughs> uh, would we like to hear that one again? Yeah. yeah. Good. Right, well, while they're doing that, you watch what's happening, and I'll tell you a little bit about these guns. This gun, by the way, has a name. It's been christened Bella. That's Hebrew for destroyer. It's the name of the first son of Samuel. It's made by using some metal staves, like you find in a bucket. In this case, it's metal. It's then fastened together using heat shrink metal hooks around it to pull it into place. 